So I'll be giving an overview of nutrient sampling we did in Lake Air Basin. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be a bit science-based, a bit technical. Just check that your machine's on. There's a little switch on the top. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Great. Okay, as I was saying, this might be a little bit technical. Um, unfortunately, I might have to use the word chemistry a few times throughout. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to give you enough context for you to follow what I'm, I'm talking about. So just to give you a really brief background on nutrients, of course, they are quite essential for aquatic life and for proper ecosystem function. The two big drivers of, for nutrients are generally nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and most importantly, the uh, biologically available uh, nutrients are, are nitrate, ammonium, or phosphate forms of these two. Of course, there's also not minor nutrients, which includes potassium or, or zinc. And apart from the nutrients, there are a number of water quality parameters, um, such as acidity or dissolved oxygen or temperature, which impact how these nutrients can be accessed by the ecosystem. And, and therefore, all these different parameters interact with each other. But generally, what we, uh, in terms of Australia, it's, it's uh, generally seen as a low nutrient um, systems. Um, and if we see nutrients get too high, for example, then we might expect some um, perturbation to the ecosystem, um, such as algal blooms, and then the ecosystem goes out of balance, and you get all sorts of problems. So, as Melissa was saying, um, we fit into um, looking at environmental indicators of, of environmental condition. We're looking at nutrients uh, based on some historical data that we found, um, which is pretty sporadic, as well as some SA EPA monitoring programs. Um, so, for example, you can see in this plot uh, of total phosphorus levels in the Warburton River in South Australia, these values are, are way above this red line, which uh, represents the Australian New Zealand Water Quality Guidelines for total phosphorus. So you can see it's consistently quite high, and we wanted to see whether these levels could be found throughout the basin and whether they're representative or they represent a potentially disturbed ecosystem. So, um, as, uh, as Melissa said, we uh, were looking at uh, indicators such as nutrients, but we were looking at another, um, a few other um, parameters such as elements, and we're looking at different methods of, of measuring these uh, uh, in indicators of environmental condition throughout the basin. We focused on the Diamantina and Georgina rivers, uh, mainly because we're chemists, and there wasn't very, very much uh, water quality data available here. We also know that uh, there's extensive grazing in these regions and, and gas extraction is uh, expanding on the edges of, of the catchment as well. So in September last year we went out and collected water and sediment samples. Uh, we collected sediments because as far as we can see there's very little to no data available for, for nutrient status. We did a, a longitudinal type transect along the system, basically went as far north as we could and came south uh, collecting samples along the way. Although it's important to stress this was a very disconnected system, uh, we were driving hundreds of kilometres between waterways. And, and basically we wanted to see whether the information we gathered could, um, could stack up against previous data and whether this might be baseline levels, natural levels, or whether it was indicative of some impact in the region. So just to give you a brief overview of the area where we sampled, um, basically it's very big, um, with a very small population. It's extensively grazed, especially in the channel country uh, near the border, um, sort of in the middle of that yellow line. And in the period where we did sampling, the, the rainfall for the year had been quite low. Pretty much the whole area was, uh, was in drought and quite water stressed. Um, all I would really want you to get out of this table while the chemists salivate away is um, that when we went into the field, we did some measurements in the field, um, mainly for the water quality parameters, and we also looked at we collected samples and, and stored them as best as we could, the nutrients, trace elements we brought back to the lab and analysed. We also looked at hormones and uh, organic carbon as well to see if this could uh, um, potentially show any impacts of cattle grazing in the area. Um, we used a particular type of organic carbon analysis for this, which I'll explain later. Just to give you a brief overview of sites, going from left to right is basically going from north to south in the region. The main takeaway message from this is it was quite dry when we were there, um, particularly in South Australia, a lot of the sites we couldn't sample because there was basically nothing in the system. 
Now, the only yardstick that we really have um, against the data that we've collected uh, the, from the historical data and the field samples were the uh, ANZAC and Arm, Arm Cairns water quality guidelines basically relating to Australia and New Zealand conditions for freshwater and marine water and to a smaller extent uh, sediments. Um, basically these give values for a range of physical and, and chemical stresses such as nutrients or, or water quality parameters. Basically the way these are taken is uh, a reference site which is considered to be not impacted or, or a number of reference sites, samples are taken from that. Based on this, these samples taken over a, a range of time, for example, you can get a frequency distribution of the values of those stresses. And, and based on this, if, if you're in the highest 20% of values, then that's where the trigger values usually put. These can often be combined to, to give guideline values with aquatic toxicity data, often generated in the lab, to have more of a, a risk-based approach. And basically, the guidelines are just there to say, OK, we've reached this um, level. Um, should we do something else and, and have a look a bit more at the system? So the values that we were comparing with our data, um, the guideline values relate to um, the frequency distribution combined with the aquatic toxicity data, which we looked at for sediments and, and trace elements, and default trigger values, which followed the frequency distribution approach. So there was no aquatic toxicity data. And we did this for nutrients and water quality parameters, and this was but the reference site used for this was South Central Australia. As far as I can see, this was uh, the Cooper Creek was used as a reference site. So just quickly, I'll throw up a few different water quality parameters. In this case, pH, acidity, or dissolved oxygen. They were well oxygenated systems, even though they were under considerable drought stress. Now, with the plots, um, what we see is a, a, on the left of the plot, there's a slightly grey shaded area. I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, that indicates the Diamantina portion of the river. After that grey grade area, um, we're starting up north of the Georgina again until we come down to Birdsville, which is towards the end, um, where the two systems join up. The red lines that I've drawn on the plots are the water quality guideline values. So in the case of turbidity, you can see that it, it's greatly exceeded in, in most of the sites. In terms of salinity, um, there's quite a broad trigger value for salinity because obviously these are areas with highly variable flows. So if you want to know whether salinity values exceeded or, or not the, the trigger values, um, the answer in this case is yes. So with nutrients, um, once again with the plots, you can see the greyed out areas, which doesn't really seem that grey. Anyway, so. We have uh, nitrate, which is the biologically available nitrogen, and the total nitrogen level trigger values shown there. The light blue values are the nitrate values. The grey values are the uh, total nitrogen values. So the take home message is most of the nitrate, most of the nitrogen in the water was in the biologically available form. The dark, uh, the black, and the dark blue values are historical values that we were able to get, very sporadic, um, and that generally shows that we got reasonably good agreement with, with uh, historical values. The other take home message for, for nitrogen is that the guideline values were exceeded at the majority of the sites. And pretty much the same story with phosphorus. The blue values are, are phosphate, the biologically available phosphorus. Um, we could only get total phosphorus values historically and they were much higher than our grey total phosphorus values that we measured. But in general, once again, we saw these guideline values exceeded. In terms of trace elements, we didn't see too many in, in waterways. Um, aluminium was a notable exception, and a lot of sites it did exceed that um, the red line for the trigger value uh, at 0 0.055 milligrams per litre. Um, now, aluminium is a bit of a tricky element. It's only toxic when it's in its free form, but it's often found in the environment as complexes with hydroxides or particulate matter. So we were measuring the total aluminium value, but we didn't weren't able to separate whether it was potentially dangerous. So even though it exceeded guideline values, this guideline value in this case is really telling you where you need to dig a little bit deeper to see what form the aluminium was in. And we saw the same thing with arsenic and sediments. Um, even though a lot of the sites guideline values were uh, exceeded, it, arsenic's in many different forms in the environment. It can be complex in, in many different ways. And the main question here is, is it available or is it toxic in terms of um, its concentrations in the sediment? Um, one one finding was that 
it was below detection limit in all our water samples, which might go a little way to answering that question. So when we're measuring total values of these elements or, or of nitrogen or phosphorus, we always need to keep some biological um, context with them. We did find one site in Birdsville where we could make historical comparisons with more than one, <laughs> one value, the famous Birdsville pubs here. Um, with sorry budget at the moment, you can imagine where we were drinking beer. Um, but anyway, the um, take home message from this is that in terms of turbidity, nitrates, total nitrogen, phosphate and total phosphorus for both our values we collected and for the historical data were generally exceeding guideline values. So you can start to see a little bit of a pattern here with um, a lot of these, um, com uh, a lot of these um, nutrients we were looking for. Now, I don't want to dazzle you too much with science, but I'm going to have to a little bit. Uh, we looked at um, fluorescence uh, of dissolved organic carbon. Um, basically, fluorescence, you shine a light on carbon and it emits light at a different wavelength, and we can graph that. What we've done uh, with tracking wastewater from sewage treatment plants is, is using this technique to see where microbial uh, dissolved organic carbon is present. So the plot on the right is, is clean water and the big bright light on the right, on the right of that plot is humic and fulvic acids. They're normally derived from degradation of plant material, for example. On the left, where you have the bright red and the, and the green um, <coughs> signals on the left, these are generally derived from microbial process. So if you have a big microbial community, um, then you tend to see this signal. Um, we wanted to look at this to see whether um, cattle in the area might be contributing uh, microbial organic carbon to the, to the samples. So just as an example, um, two sites that were quite close to each other, I mean quite close, so about 100 kilometres apart, um, one around the Diamantina National Park. In, in the old cork sample, you can see in the bottom left, you're getting some microbial signals there. Um, and we did see limited evidence, evidence of cattle around the area. Uh, on the other hand, Diamantina, we didn't see much of a signal, although observation was that uh, both cattle stations to the north and south had busted the fences down and they were enjoying all the grass that was in the national park. So what we actually saw didn't really match up with the analysis that we were getting. In terms of our um, hormone analysis, um, we didn't detect any in water samples, and this can be for a number of reasons. For example, they could be degraded, they could be bound to sediments. We did detect an estrogen estrone in sediments at Diamantina National Park, which kind of lined up with what we saw with the cattle. Um, although most of these cattle are bulls, and we didn't find any androgens anywhere. So that kind of killed that theory. Mm -hmm. um, however, we did see evidence of cattle at most sites. And even though estrone is an androgen, it can get, uh, androgens can be degraded to form estrone. So it's possible that this might be a legacy of, of cattle being in this site. Uh, it's associating with the sediments and we're picking it up. But this obviously needs a lot more uh, work done on it before we can definitively say there was an impact. So to summarise, we saw at uh, the majority of sites for nitrate, phosphate, turbidity uh, and aluminium, the water quality guidelines were exceeded and these were generally in the Diamantina River and in the lower catchment, so from Birdsville down into South Australia. Um, we also saw this quite commonly with our um, historical data that we could drag up as well, so there's a, there's a precedent for that as well. The station owners and, and the traditional owners that we talked to ane anecdotally, anecdotally um, suggested that they were quite happy with the quality of the water, the cows were happy, there was lots of fish. Um, and our uh, assessment of whether there were impacts of cattle was based on our dissolved organic carbon and hormone analysis were pretty much unclear. So we are only, and, and putting into context, we're only looking at the chemistry of these systems. Um, so in terms of the Goida project, there will also be biological and hydrological assessments done as well which will give a clearer idea of ecological condition and we really need to wait to feed our results in, in, into those um, projects to get a good idea of, of what relevance these have and whether it's time to revisit the water quality guidelines which just happen to be uh, being updated right now. Um, so for future work, really briefly, it would be great to sample when there's a lot of rainfall around such as uh, now apparently. Um, the sediment, we saw quite high levels of, of, set, of uh, nutrients in the sediments. 
how important they are in, uh, in cycling nutrients or elements through the system and also the soil in the system as well. Uh, it's very important to put these, this chemistry, chemical data into, the, um, into a biological context. So are the fish happy? Are the invertebrates happy? And most importantly, methodology we found a little bit tricky um, because we weren't really sure how some of the historical data was generated. So we need to make sure that when we do these comparisons that we're comparing apples with apples, or at least Granny Smiths with Fujis. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge all of these people who couldn't have uh, done the sampling without their help. Um, and maybe there's time for a few quick questions or email me if you, if you wanted to. Thank you.